In this section, we're actually going to define what energy is. We're going to look at some different types. We're going to look at the units and do a few other things to get us ready to actually start talking about energy, heat, and flow of energy in chemical systems. One classification scheme that chemists use is to group energy into two main types, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is actually the energy that all objects have, and it's based on their relative position, their composition, or some state or condition that they are in. Sort of a real world example of that is this water here being held back by this dam. This water has the potential for releasing energy or transferring it if I could just let it go. And we can. We can actually convert that potential energy into kinetic energy, which is the energy that an object possesses because of its motion. So let's look at that. Here I have my potential energy held back by the dam. I open up my sluice gate, allow that water to flow from a high level to a low level. As it's flowing, it actually has kinetic energy. It's moving. So my energy was actually changed from potential energy over to kinetic energy. And hopefully we could use that kinetic energy to do something useful. Let's look at a few examples that are related to chemistry. Examples of both potential energy and kinetic energy. When we think of potential energy, we're going to call it capital E sub P now, and we think about it from a chemical standpoint, we think of it as the energy of position or energy that is stored. And where do chemical compounds store energy? That's typically in the bonds, okay? So if I look at bond energies, I have attractions, electrostatic attractions and repulsions. The nucleus, which is positive, is actually attracted to the electrons. That's a form of potential energy. My protons, they typically repel each other. And also I can actually even have ionic attraction in ionic compounds or elements. Let's look at ionic compounds for us. And I've first, and I've actually drawn a potential energy diagram here. So in my y-axis is energy in kilojoules per mole. And when I look at down here at the bottom, that is the most stable form of energy. As I go up the scale here, I go to higher energy, which is going to be unstable. On my x-axis, I'm literally just looking at the distance between two ions here, a positively charged and a negatively charged. So when they're separated by a long distance, they don't see each other. So there's zero potential energy, essentially, like that. As I bring them closer together and I bring them real close together, they tend to no longer attract each other. These charges actually repel each other. The electrons repel each other and the protons repel each other. They're all of a sudden at a very high potential energy state. If I go down here to the bottom here, where they're at just the right position, they're just close enough that the repulsions and attractions actually counter each other. Now I'm at a very stable position. Okay, And so in this case, I can also release energy by breaking that bond. That's potential energy. I can look at covalent bonds and sort of go through the same argument. I have potential energy over here on my y-axis. I have distance between atoms on my x-axis. In this case, two hydrogen atoms. If I bring them closer and closer together, they tend to become more and more stable until they reach a point and here at minus 432 kilojoules per mole, where they actually form a bond. And so that distance here on my x-axis is actually my bond distance of a stable hydrogen molecule. They cannot get any closer together because my energy, my potential energy goes up so fast, it's no longer stable. 
They want to sit down here in this sort of bowl down here where I have a minimum in my energy here, where they're at just the right distance to actually form a bond, which is sort of the minimum energy of these interactions. Chemicals also have energy in the form of kinetic energy. We're going to represent that by a capital E with a subscript K. Kinetic energy, again, is the energy of motion. We actually have a formula for that where the kinetic energy of a body is one half times the mass times the velocity squared. So velocity is motion. It sort of makes sense. All atoms and molecules are moving. So if they're moving with some velocity, they are and contain kinetic energy. Most of the time, these are related to either translations, rotations, or vibrations. For example, if I have an atom or a molecule moving through space, it has a velocity, so therefore it has kinetic energy. If they're spinning, or if they're bending, or they're stretching, they contain either vibrational or rotational motion, which means they're moving relative to each other, therefore they contain energy. When we think about energy, we often think about motion as being related to temperature, because the more temperature, the more heat, the higher temperature I have in a system, the faster things are moving, the faster the velocity, the more energy I have. So if I look at a distribution here, I look at my x-axis here as being a percent of molecules and my x-axis being kinetic energy. If I first look at this first black line here and I look at all the molecules that I have and I say most of my molecules here have a very low kinetic energy, okay? If I heat them up, they're now moving faster. I have a new graph at a new temperature here, which shows that most of my molecules now, on average, have a distribution are of higher temperature and are moving faster. Kinetic energy of atoms and molecules. There are some rules that have come out of a lot of research. One of them is the law of conservation of energy. That means that during a chemical reaction or a physical change like melting or freezing, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It is just changed. So during a chemical or physical change, the form of energy is actually just changed or could be changed. An example of that is going back to our dam and our sluice gate here. Water flowing, I know, is kinetic energy. But when it flows through that tube, it can actually be sent through a turbine, which can convert that energy into electrical energy. And then that electrical energy can be sent down the power lines and be converted into light energy or thermal energy, all kinds of different energy. At all times, none of our energy is actually lost or created or destroyed. It has just changed its form. When we think about radiant and thermal and electrical, those five different forms of energy, thermal energy is a very important form of energy in chemistry. In fact, this whole chapter on thermal chemistry is dedicated to studying the chemistry of heat and energy. As mentioned early, kinetic energy is associated with random motion of atoms and molecules. We know this type of kinetic energy as thermal energy. So fast moving molecules, they actually have high thermal energy, or we could say they're hot. Slow moving molecules, they have low thermal energy, or we could call them cold. Here are a couple examples. If I have an iron bar and I have it cold, those atoms, those individual iron atoms in the bar are not moving very fast. If I have a hot iron bar, the individual atoms within that bar actually have some kinetic energy. They're moving. 
And as they transfer that kinetic energy over to other atoms, we actually have an increase in temperature. Temperature is actually the quantitative measure of hot and cold. So if we want to know how fast these molecules are moving, how much kinetic energy is in each of these two iron bars, we're just going to measure its temperature. When we think of measuring temperature, we think of thermometers, we think of thermocouples or thermistors. We even have devices now that can measure temperature by using infrared radiation. In most houses, at least out in some backyards, they actually have a thermometer based on expanding metals. And finally, what we typically often use in the chemistry laboratory, at least we used to when I was in laboratory, we use these alcohol thermometers to measure differences in temp temperature or changes in temperature, which we can relate to changes in energy, hot and cold. So temperature can be used to measure the transfer of heat from one system to another. Because when we look at temperature, we can see how temperature changes as something gains energy or something loses energy. We're going to now call that heat flow. Rather than talking about hot and cold, we're typically going to restrict our discussion to the word heat now. And we're going to represent heat in a chemical reaction or a physical change in some compound as the small letter Q. Q is the transfer of thermal energy between two bodies at different temperatures. Okay? And that is actually then related to heat flow. That's increasing the thermal energy of one body and decreasing the thermal energy of another. As an example here, I take this piece of steel, I heat it up in a flame, in this case a Bunsen burner, I'm going to now put it in a beaker of water. That water is sitting at 18.1 degrees C. Once I put that bar into the water, I'm transferring the heat from that bar to the water and the temperature of my water starts to increase. So when two substances are placed in contact, thermal energy, heat, will flow from the higher temperature substance over to the lower temperature substance. This heat flow will continue until both substances are at the same temperature. So if I wait long enough, my iron bar will eventually be at the same temperature as the water. And I can measure that by using some sort of thermometer or digital device. When matter undergoes either a chemical reaction or a physical change, that chemical reaction or physical change can either release energy or it can absorb energy. And that's usually in the form of heat, as we're going to discuss in this chapter. If during that change heat is absorbed, we call that an endothermic process. An example of that would be a cold pack which is a combination of this ammonia nitrate and water. It actually absorbs heat, which then makes it feel cold. And we often think of that as actually using in a cold pack to actually treat injuries like sprains. We also have chemical processes or chemical changes where we release heat. That is called an exothermic reaction. So in this case over here, we also can purchase heat packs where when I stir that materials up, this magnesium sulfate in water, I actually form a new compound and it releases energy in the form of heat. And I use that hot pack actually to treat sore muscles. So I have endothermic reactions which absorb heat and I have exothermic reactions which give off heat. I also have physical changes that are endothermic, they absorb heat, and I have physical changes that are exothermic, they release heat.
Let's look at that from an energy diagram standpoint. So in a chemical reaction, I have reactants, and here I have products. In this case, my y-axis is going to be energy. So if I go from low energy to high energy, I need to ab have absorbed energy. So this has to be an endothermic reaction, just like the one for the cold pack. In an exothermic reaction, I have reactants at high energy, and my products are at low energy. In order to get from reactants to products, I release energy, just like our hot pack. So this is sort of the diagrammatic way of representing chemical reactions that are either endothermic, absorbing energy, or exothermic, releasing energy. In addition to heating and cooling, energy can be used to move things. In other words, energy can be used to do work okay, rather than just heating or cooling things. Let's look at a few examples of that. So energy is typically defined as the capacity to supply heat, which we've just talked about when we talk about exothermic and endothermic reactions, or do work. And so energy can be defined as heat plus work. An example of work would actually be when we actually move something, so force times distance. Sort of an example that we'd like to use is a piston moving during a combustion reaction. So in our combustion engines in our car, we have a chemical reaction which actually forces the piston to move as gases expand. That is actually caused work. Heat, again, is just the other form of energy where the amount of warmth transferred from one object to another results in a temperature difference. So even back here at our internal combustion reaction, we do more than just move pistons. We actually heat our car up. So there's, we'd like to have most of our energy in the form of work in that case, but some of it ends up being heat. An example of heat transfer in a chemical reaction or a physical change is actually warm water transferring heat over to the ice. Remember, energy always goes from a warm object to a cold object. The word thermochemistry or the field of thermochemistry is the study of heat absorbed or released during a chemical or physical change. And we're going to discuss that in a lot of detail in the rest of this chapter. Heat transferred in the form of absorbing or being released. So let's look at those terms again. Let's see, energy is transferred either by heat or work. We know that the change in energy is going to be equal to heat or work. And so if we want to think of Q as heat transferred, we can also think, and we do this often in chemistry, work is often pressure times the change in volume, like for a piston moving. Okay. So let's look at the sign conventions, okay? Because we've also mentioned that we can either absorb or release energy, so we need to have a plus or minus so we, we know whether we're absorbing energy or releasing energy. So heat. A plus sign means that the system, whatever that chemical reaction in, is gaining energy. A minus means it's losing thermal energy. If we have a plus on W, that means work is being done on the system. If we have a minus, that means work is being done by the system. We're moving a piston. The total change in energy, that flow of energy, if I have a plus sign on my final delta E, which means Q times W, if I have plus, my energy is flowing into the system. If I have a minus, energy is flowing out of the system in the form of both work and or in the form of thermal energy. So if I look and I want to now define Q, Q is equal to the change in energy of the system plus the amount of work. 
But if we work at costs, constant volumes, you can see my change in volume here equals zero. We can then think of heat as actually equal to the change in energy of the whole system, which makes everything simplified if we ha work at a constant volume. And that's what chemists do. We tend to work at constant volume for a lot of our chemical reactions so we can calculate heat transfer very accurately and don't have to worry about changes in volume, which then talks about the changes in work. Let's now look at the units of energy. Historically, especially here in the United States, energy has been measured in units of calories, a small C-A-L. Calorie was originally defined as the amount of energy required to, one, to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. When we talk about calories and how it's related to food, that's calories with a capital C. So there is a difference. This capital C or large calorie is used to quantify food energy, and that is actually a kilocalorie. The SI units for energy are is joules, and we're going to use joules from now on in chemistry. A joule is defined as the amount of energy needed to move one kilogram of mass to a speed of one meter per second. So that's mass times speed. This word joule is actually named in honor of the English physicist James Prescott Joule, who first defined this measurement of energy and did a lot of work on it. If I look over at the nutritional facts on most food products, they list the energy or the amount of calories on that product label. In Europe, they always list the energy in kilojoules. So there is a conversion factor. One calorie equals 4.184 joules, and one big calorie equals 1,000 small calories, which is also equal to 4.184 kilojoules. Another concept that we need to understand in thermochemistry is the first law of thermodynamics. It states that the total internal energy, represented by either capital E, or in some textbooks, like our own, occasionally they slide in capital U. The total internal energy in an isolated system is always constant. Okay? So if I have an isolated system and I have some energy in that system, that energy is going to be constant. Now, it can be transferred within that system to other things in the system through either heat or work. And if I look at that total internal energy, the absolute amount of energy can never be determined. That's because we have interactions outside our system, outside our surroundings that are always involved. So we often measure in the laboratory the change in energy. So I look at the final energy of my system and I subtract from that my initial energy that is the energy transferred, or delta E. If we're talking about thermochemistry, we're going to talk about the final heat minus the initial heat in the system. So if I look at this sort of system here, the green beaker here is my system. That's where I actually have my energy. If I put energy into the system, so I have a positive flow of energy from the surroundings into the system, my change in energy is going to be positive. If some of my energy flows out of my system into the surroundings, my change in energy for my system is going to be negative. In other words, my final energy is going to be less than my initial. So if we define system, the system is either a material or a process. 
where, which we are studying where energy changes have happened. The surrounding is everything else that is sort of surrounding my system here. Okay. So this change in energy or delta E is dependent on what the system is and what the surroundings are. For example, if this system here is a beaker for a water, my heat transfer or my energy transfer will be, will be different if this is a beaker of ethanol. Also, it also depends on my surroundings. If this surroundings is air, my heat transfer will be different if these surroundings are water. We make the big assumption in these calculations that everything outside this known volume, this known amount of surroundings, does not interact at all with energy transfer. So we make some big assumptions there. When we measure the change in temperature of a system and its surroundings, we do this in order to measure how much heat is transferred between the system and surroundings, either into the system or out of the system. It depends on what those materials are. It depends on what the system is, and it depends on what the surroundings are. So there must be some constant for every single body of matter that relates its ability to either absorb or release energy in the form of heat. We call that its heat capacity, or capital C subscript P, or sometimes we just represent it of capital C. We define that as the quantity of heat, Q, that is absorbed or released when that substance, that piece of matter, experiences a temperature change of one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Heat capacity is an extensive property because it depends on the amount of material that's present. We define heat capacity, capital C, small p, as the heat divided by the change in temperature. And all different materials have different heat capacities. Iron is different than water, that is different than air, that's different than cobalt. Okay. Notice that I do not have mass or moles in this equation at all. So what chemists typically use is actually something called specific heat capacity, small c, subset, subscript p, or just small c. We often refer to this as just specific heat. It is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So specific heat, small c, subscript P, is an intensive property. It only depends on the quantity of the substance, not the amount. So if I look at C sub P, I can see that I still have heat, small q, divided by the change in temperature. But now I've added M, which is just the mass of the material. So C sub P, which is an intensive property, I can now use that to actually calculate the heat transfer from my system to my surroundings, depending on what their, those materials are. Let's look at an example of heat capacity and specific heat to try to understand the difference between the two. Here I have two frying pans, a small one and a large one. They're both made out of iron. So if I look at the specific heat of these two frying pans, because they're made out of the same thing, they have the same specific heat or the same specific heat capacity of 0 0.449 joules per gram per degree C. You can see that's the same over here on the large frying pan, but they have different masses. This small frying pan cannot absorb as much heat as the large frying pan. So if we want to know how much heat this small frying pan can actually absorb or be transferred from the heating plate, we're going to look at its 
heat capacity. It has a heat capacity of 808 joules per degree C. Where the large frying pan can absorb more energy, it has a heat capacity of 2,424 joules per degree C. But because these frying pans are made out of the same material, both frying pans have the same specific heat capacity, small c, or the same specific heat, which we'll normally refer to it as specific heat. Here is a table of specific heats for a number of very common substances. If I look down at this table, there are a few that stand out. The specific heat for water is 4.184 joules per gram per degree C. That number seems familiar. That's because that also relates it to joules. That's the amount of energy in one calorie to raise that temperature one degree C for one gram. So that's how that number has actually came about. Okay. If I look at that and I look at this table down here, I look at gold, it has a very poor specific heat relative to things like air or water or things like that. One of the reasons that it's important that water have such a has such a large high specific heat that means it takes a lot of energy to heat one gram of that material up that actually keeps our earth at a constant temperature because most of our earth is water it takes a lot of energy to actually heat that water up so it's an important property of water if i go up this list Going up this list, more energy is required to heat one gram of material one degree Celsius. Let's look back at that equation for specific heat. Small c equals heat divided by the mass times the change in temperature. We can rearrange that now so that we can now solve for heat that's actually equal to a constant, which is dependent on what the material is, times how much material we have, times the change in temperature. I can further expand that equation to say that we're going to define change in temperature as the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So here are sort of our units for that. The units for Q is joules. The units for mass is grams. The units for specific heat are joules per gram per degree C. And my units for temperature are in degree C. So if a substance gains thermal energy, in other words, my final temperature is greater than my initial temperature, my value for Q when I solve this equation is going to be a positive value. If my substance loses thermal energy, in other words, my final temperature is less, it's going to be colder than my initial temperature, the value for Q is going to be a negative value. Keeping track of negative and positives is very important when we talk about doing calculations in thermal chemistry. Let's do an example problem where we use our equation for heat change to actually solve a very practical problem. Let's assume I have a Diet Mountain Dew sitting on this table here. I know that most of the Mountain Dew is actually just water, so I know the specific heat of water. It's 4.184 joules per gram per degree C. In this bottle of Mountain Dew, it's a 350 gram bottle of Mountain Dew and the room temperature is 25 degrees C. If I take that bottle and I put it in a cooler, that cooler is now at 3 degrees C. If I wait long enough, both my cooler and my Mountain Dew will come in equilibrium with each other. And so I can do the calculation. I'm just going to take my equation. Heat change is equal to C my specific heat of water, 
times the mass of water, which is 350 grams, times the temperature change. My final temperature is 3, minus my initial temperature is 25. Do the mathematics. It turns out that the heat change is minus 32,200 joules in this case. In other words, it's a negative value, so my Mountain Dew loses thermal energy. If I did the opposite calculation, I would find out that my cooler actually gained that same amount of energy. That's my surroundings. Let's do a second example. I have a flask which contains 8.0 times 10 to the 2 grams of water, in other words, 820 grams of water. It is heated, and the temperature of the water increases from 21 degrees, that's my initial temperature, to 85 degrees. How much heat did the water absorb? We can go right back to our equation that we've derived from our specific heat definition. Q equals the specific heat times the mass of the material times the final temperature minus the initial temperature. I know this is water, so I have a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram per degree C. I have 800 grams of water. It's initially at 81 degrees C, 21 degrees C. I heat it up with a Bunsen burner to 85 degrees C. That's my final temperature. Go through the arithmetic, I get 2.1 joules. My water now gains thermal energy, so that's my system. It better have a positive value, and the math works out that way. Let's do a third example. In this case, I actually know the amount of energy that is lost in the system. My system is a 251 gram aluminum block, as shown here. If the block is initially at 125 degrees, and I know that I've lost 24.1 kilojoules of energy, what will be my final temperature? Okay, I need to know the constant. I know, need to know the specific heat of aluminum. I can go look that up in a table. I then can go back to my equation for heat absorbed or heat lost. I know that I have minus 24 1,100 joules. Notice I already made the change over to joules, kilo, from kilojoules here to get everything in the right units. It's going to be equal to the specific heat of aluminum times the mass of aluminum times the temperature change. The only thing I know is my initial temperature. I need to find out what my final temperature is. Go through the algebra here. My final temperature in this case is going to be 18 degrees C. The concept of specific heat is so important in chemistry that we're going to do a fourth example. In this case, I want to actually calculate the specific heat of a metal. So let's say I have 12.5 grams of metal. It absorbs 115 joules of energy and the temperature rises from 20.2 to 24.5. I can go back to our heat flow equation. I can start putting in values for that. I have 115 joules which I've measured some other way in the laboratory. I don't know what the metal is so I don't know what the specific heat is but I can weigh it and I can actually measure the temperature change by actually heating the material. So I go through and put in the values, 115 joules, 12.5 grams. I know my final temperature. I know my initial temperature. Do the calculations. It turns out this material has a specific heat of 18 joules per gram per degree C. I now could go to a table and actually look that up. So how do chemists actually measure energy flow? We call that methodology calorimetry. So we're going to now look in the next section 
specifically how we measure these temperatures. So can we, because we know just heating this block on this plate here is not very specific and it's not very controlled. So now we'll look at calorimetry.